Good morning everybody. So it's that time of the week where we're connecting. So this Facebook live thing is about connecting and um, specifically connecting women connecting with men and men connecting with women and the difference in those two ways of connecting. So this has been a really difficult topic for me to think about and in the book that I'm now trying to complete after the whole, <laughs> the whole Bali thing. Um, there we go. After the whole Bali thing, I, I reckon that it wouldn't be so difficult. And then when I got to this specific chapter, I really got stuck and it really was very difficult for me to um, talk about this, to talk about specifically how do you how do you connect with the other gender and the reason why it's been so hard and this is me bearing my soul to the world um, was that prior to getting divorced it was very for me to work with either men or women it didn't really make a difference and what I didn't realize very naively when I got divorced I realized that the way you are perceived as a woman in the workplace is very different um, and whether it is just in your mind because you no longer have a ring on your finger or people know you're not married or whatever the case may be it was such a shock on my system how different I was treated that I actually went and had a conversation with my dad and I remember at the time I phoned him and I said to him dad you know I'm 43 years old and I need to I need to get some advice because I'm struggling I I I honestly think I show up I try to be authentic I try to be myself when I'm dealing with clients and customers um, but something is being misread yeah because the kind of comments that I'm getting is different from what I received before and I had to change my rules of engagement completely I had to change the way I engaged with men completely the other thing that also happened was that I also had to change the way I engaged with women because what I also didn't know was that when you are married, um, women also treat you as non-threatening. And the moment you are single and that sort of thing, then suddenly women feel different. And I thought it was just like a myth. I honestly thought it wasn't true, but it's true. And it took me incredibly long to accept that it's nothing I did wrong but it is the way that people show up and it is our own fears and our own concerns etc so what I also was trying to was how women really often really struggle in the workplace and the reason why I was so completely naive and completely blind was that I I worked for myself. I worked for myself for my entire career, apart from two years in London. So for the rest of the time, I didn't realize how women really struggled. And it was only last year when I was approached by, at the time, a, a, a client, but also a really good friend, Gretchen Blake, and she said to me, listen, there's a big gender conversation going on and I really love your tools and, and the stuff that you do, but you need to work on creating something that can help us to find balance. And I was honestly blown away because I thought it wasn't such a big deal um, because, because I never really experienced the pain myself as in struggling to, to do what I need to do because of my goal. And I said, no problem, I'll do that. And I went on the Camino and the idea was that I would think clearly and it would, I would come up with these brilliant ideas and, and how to do this and of course I didn't. And then I was asked to speak at an HR in Doba 
um, in, at the Sandton Convention Center. And it was funny because the people left me, they said to me, either you can sit on a panel that talks about internal politics in organizations, or you can sit on a panel that talks about leadership, women in leadership. And I thought, there's no freaking way on earth I'm doing an internal politics nonsense thing. It's not nonsense, it's not nonsense, but I'm just a little bit over it. And um, so I sat on the panel and it was funny because I flew up for the conference. I literally got there and um, I sat on the stage <laughs> with these really amazing girls. And I mean, they, those that know me will, <laughs> will know that's not necessarily how I will operate, but they've got these beautiful shoes with the high heels and they're so hot and happening and they are phenomenal and they're these hot HR people. Um, and I sat on the stage with them. So prior to, prior to the conference, um, I thought to myself, sure, I better do some research on this whole gender issue. So, to come to my house and really said to me, wake up, Sissy, you need to help me months prior to that. And to and I bet it, you know, obviously this is a thing, naively. And um, so I started reading and I started listening and I was so shocked. And uh, <laughs> the one night I was sitting here and my bathroom is next door and my son, my 10 year old was in the bath and I was watching a show on YouTube about this whole gender story and it was loud enough that he could hear and he came out of, running out of the bathroom and he said to me, Mama, do you realize what you just heard? And he said, how is it possible? And this is what he heard, that women weren't allowed to speak. Now, this was in Rwanda. In 1994, the legislation said that women weren't allowed to speak, speak in public. And in 1995, there was this massive massacre. And Rwanda is the only country apart from one of these, I don't I should really check it, but I think it's Sweden. Apart from one of these countries that have got 50-50 women and men in leadership and in government, etc. So the story is that what happened was because of the fact that most of the men were killed, women were they had to step up. They had to come up and deliver. So I had an interview last night on Aris here. It was incredibly hard to do because I had to speak so bit Afrikaans and my eldest though was so worried that I'm going to be talking Bengals, which of course is, is normal for us. Um, and the conversation was about why is it that we struggle to keep women in senior leadership positions? And the reality is we struggle to keep women in senior leadership positions because the environment is not suitable. So women get cut for. At some point they say, you know what, I don't need this. And they walk away. And the money can't buy, the status can't buy them, nothing could buy them. And they get to a point where it's just not okay. So the question that I was asked last night and that I was also asked at this Asia and Dorba is how do we change it? How do we shift it? And I truly honestly believe that first of all, there's a massive freaking business case for inclusivity. So in other words, to have a lack of diverse team. If you've got a your, your organization will perform double as well. I don't know if that's a sentence, but the performance will be much better. The engagement levels will be better. Women are so good at juggling that complex thoughts and keeping things, bringing different ways of thinking into the workplace. And if we are able and to, to just become a little bit self-aware of what's going on for us and we can be authentic and real about it, then what we can do is this, a CEO, for example, this is the kind of conversation that I like to have with the CEO, is to say, okay, so you want your organization to thrive. At the moment, you've got 11, 12, 13%, that's sort of the standard, uh, senior leaders as women. Okay, that's really bad. So if we want to move it to at least 30, and if you look at the 30% club and the amazing work that Colin Lawson and her team is doing, you will see that your performance in the organization will improve. There's lots of data and research to show this. 
If the CEO buys into it and he truly gets it and he understands what the benefit is from a business perspective, that's a big tick. Secondly, if that person is honestly saying, yeah, but of course, you know, we're at least equals, then it's another big tick. Because if the CEO gets it, the culture will follow. And even though you might have an organization where either the women are feeling so threatened and so they, we, we've been so trained to be loud and be out there and be bitches, that we think we need to be as harsh as, as that, if that is the case, we will still be able to shift it. Because the moment you make people aware of this, then you can shift it. So that's one of the things that I'm really super duper excited about because we've got this gender perception tool. So let me tell you how that works because it's, it's actually freaking amazing. So what it does is we measure how a chick feels about herself in the workplace and at home and everything about you. And then what we do is we take that and we say, that's fantastic. Now we know what your stuff is. What's your shit? What is it that you've got to deal with? And it creates a self-awareness. So if I realize that I'm actually behaving like a cow, I can change it. The second step is to say, okay, boys, now you are anonymously going to be responding on how you see women in the workplace. And if it comes out that 80% of the men that work for you are a bunch of bastards and they actually secretly hate women or they feel threatened by it or whatever the case is, or they think they're less than or whatever, then we know. And then we can close that gap. But also what we do is we measure how the men feel about themselves. And what that does is it creates awareness of what is it that's holding me back. And the moment you know that on an individual level and on a team level, you can shift it. So I'm incredibly hopeful that what we are trying to do at the moment in the world can shift all of this. And we're partnering with such amazing people from a digital tool to a a learning platform that you can do this sort of stuff and that really works with Angela and her group and the content and the stuff that we're creating at the moment is the kind of things that we need for this new world that we're moving into so I wanted to chat to you about that and I really get that this is a complex and a complicated environment but I do think there's lots of hope and there's lots of opportunity and if there's at any point a situation where you think it's time for your organization to transform it doesn't happen overnight of course it's a process but the starting point is to create awareness and we'd love to play with you be involved so the other thing that i quickly wanted to share with you is we're also busy with search which is a, a sports tool and ian kennedy and myself recorded a podcast um where are we now on monday that we will be sharing uh, Ian Kennedy was a professional golfer, is a, is a very amazing coach and he works with leadership teams etc and we've been sharing clients and what happened was when I was in Bali we were busy with an engagement survey project with his own, one of his own clients in the IT space and he said to me yes we must do this in the sports space because he's got so many sports clients. Now if you know anything about me you'll know that I know nothing about sports. It's actually embarrassing how little I know about sport. And if it wasn't public, I would have shared a little story about how I've many, many, many times um, embarrassed myself with famous sports people. And what Ian then said to me, listen, let's adapt it. So we've ad we're adapting the individual assessment for individual sports people and then of course teams. And we've tested it and it's awesome. And if everything goes well, we hopefully will be working with the SA Paralympic team and we will share all that information and do like a media launch for that and we'll keep you posted on that. So I hope you guys are having a beautiful week and I'll check in again with you next week. Um, probably same time, same place. Uh, please reach out, please connect with us, it's always awesome.